to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Colin, finally, I have got my poop in a group, and we are doing <laughs> the Intelligence Officer episode. I don't know. You've been signaling this for, uh, like, I don't know, two years? Forever. Yeah. This is on me. 100% on me. I'm so glad to bring you one of my closest friends, Major Zane Shiv Stedman. As we'll describe, he and I met the first day of Intel school and within minutes, we knew. You and I were kind of that way. Like we met and we just kind of knew, right? Like I'm going to be close to this person and it's just going <laughs> to, you just kind of knew. Zane and I were the exact same way. Uh, we talked last night. We talk all the time. We're both moving to Dayton, Ohio this coming summer. Uh oh. Uh, yeah, we're both going to be DOs Getting out the crew there. back together. Oh, so excited. So, but even though we get to share this amazing interview with you, we can't even cover the half of what you get to do as an intelligence officer. Yeah. And we'll talk about that on the back end, but there's just so much here. We did our best, but if you have questions, ask, send me an email. If there's one thing I can talk endlessly about, it's about being an Intel officer. I, I'm super <laughs> passionate about my career field. I absolutely love it. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions I can. So with that, we're going to bring you this episode with Major Zane Shiv Stedman. Welcome back to this week's episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Reed Gann, and today I've got my good friend, Major Zane Shiv Stedman. Zane, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, so this is the long-promised and long-awaited episode where we discuss the 14N, or Intelligence Officer Career Field. Uh, Zane and I, we met the first day of Intel school, and that's kind of, you know, the rest has been history almost, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been... Geez, you know, however many, nine years now or so. Yeah. Time went by really quick there. Absolutely. But yes, yeah, so we'll talk about Intel school. We'll talk about being an Intel officer. But let's start off with you, Zane. How, how is it that Zane Stedman finds himself a major in the Air Force? Tell us a little bit about yourself. No, yeah, thanks. So grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. None of my family had been in the military at all. Like, you know, kind of a lot of people, they're like, hey, you know, my parents or grandparents, they have a lot of military history in their family. My grandfather fought in Vietnam, enlisted and went and fought Vietnam for a few years, did not do a career or anything like that. So, you know, he's the one person in my family that has been in the military. Other than that, I didn't have any experience with it. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't like to talk about his, his experience in Vietnam for, you know, some obvious reasons. He didn't have a great experience there had a lot of PTSD and just kind of emotional and medical fallout from that experience. So I didn't grow up knowing a lot about the military, but uh, I guess I was at an air show when I was younger and I came back from that and I told my mom, Hey, you know, all these airplanes, it was a really cool air show. And my mom just being the great mom, she is kind of looked into, you know, well, Hey, if my son, you know, has this passion for something, maybe I should look into career options and maybe being a pilot. And she stumbled upon, I guess during her research, the Air Force Academy. Okay. She kind of told me about that, like, hey, you know, I've never heard of this place. You haven't. She did some research and was just like, kind of, you know, shot it to me as, hey, this is a really good education. It's a free education if you can get into the academy. Mm -hmm. And it has good opportunities if you want to be a pilot, good opportunities if you want to, you know, study whatever else. You know, it's a heavy engineering school. Uh huh. But she told me about that. I ended up, I mean, this is kind of a long story, so not long story short, but long story is I ended up going to the Air Force Academy, and that's how I kind of ended up in the military, like, you know, my gateway to the military, but that's how I ended up in the military. Okay. Yeah, we've had a couple of folks on, and they've talked about the importance and the effectiveness that air shows are, and, you know, case in point, Zane probably, I mean, it's hard to say, right, but you definitely point back to that time as something that piqued your interest. Oh, yeah. And like, obviously, I'm not a pilot now, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that, I'm sure. 
but like still when i see airplanes you know like any kind of airplane in the sky i'm like man like that's just really cool yeah yeah so yeah let's talk a little bit about that because your journey to intelligence it wasn't your you know first choice out of the academy you actually had a different plan but your experience isn't wholly unique either yeah right like it's pretty common that folks go to so you were going to be a pilot right that was kind of your big plan talk us through how that kind of works because it's not terribly uncommon i mean you and i know a few people have been through pretty similar experiences oh yeah and especially now like just having visibility in my job right now at air force personnel command and kind of seeing a lot of people's different career paths a lot of people start off in different careers and end up finding you know a career field that's kind of a a better fit for them Mm -hmm. kind of to your point but my path went like this right so i was at the academy wanted to be a pilot did a few flying programs at the academy and i was like whenever i did a flying program i always kind of left it with the feeling of hey that was really cool but I don't know if that's something that I'm extremely passionate about or something that I really, really liked or or loves doing, right? Mm -hmm. So and I was a business management major at the academy. So the two career fields I was considering was, hey, I I came here to be a pilot. Let's keep that on the table. And then being like an acquisition officer, right? Kind of going into that acquisition and more business side of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of sleepless nights at the academy trying to decide between those two career fields. Yeah ended up deciding to go the pilot training route because I just, you know, I, my kind of calculus was if I go into this and I don't like it, I can change career fields, yeah. but I, I can't really do the opposite. I can't go be an acquisition officer and then try to be a pilot later. Yeah. That's what I thought then. I guess that you can do that, but it's more difficult, right? Yeah. I definitely think that's a harder way to go. <laughs> to, oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you have the opportunity to do something like in this case, being a pilot, you know, that's a more scarce opportunity. So I wanted to give it a shot before I, you know, decided not to. Yeah. And I guess my whole takeaway from that experience was looking back, I probably in my gut knew that I didn't want to be a pilot, but I kind of still wanted to go farther down that path to be sure. Yeah. But I guess my advice to anyone, if you're making a difficult decision, you know, think about it. Yeah. Like give it some good pondering, like study it, do your research, talk to people, and then just follow your gut. And if I would have done that, you know, I would have been, I don't know where I'd be now. I still wouldn't be a pilot. But the way that it worked out for me, you know, obviously went to pilot training. I was in initial flight screening in Pueblo, Colorado, about a week left of that month course. And I was like, hey, this is really just not what I want to do. I remember talking to some people when we were studying one night and they were just like, hey, oh, flying is so fun. Like, this is so hard and so challenging and so much work. But when you're up in the air flying, it's just so worth it. And I was looking at them and I was thinking, you're right. This is challenging. It is a lot of work. It is tough, but I don't feel, I don't have that same passion that you guys have. So why would I do this right for such an extended period of my life? Yeah. If it's not something that I'm really passionate about for how challenging and how much work it is. So that was the time where I decided, Hey, I don't want to be a pilot. I want to do something else. And then the air force, you know, I put in some preferences of career fields that I was interested in and the air force ended up saying, Hey, You know, Zane, you don't want to be a pilot. Cool. We still want you in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. You should go be an intelligence officer because that's where we have a need right now and you have a background that's suitable for it. So that's where I ended up and the Air Force got that decision right. I've really enjoyed the last, you know, 10 years of my career doing it. Awesome. Yeah, that's really sound advice, especially when you talk about staring down a 10-year commitment to be a pilot in the Air Force. And there's reasons for that, right? We need pilots. It takes a lot of money and time to train them. So we don't want them to get trained up and leave in three or four years. But yeah, you got to love it because it is a lot of hard work. I've heard that from a lot of folks, you know, pilot training was tough, but as soon as I get up in the air, you know, all that goes away. But if you're not feeling that way, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, pilot training is challenging, a lot of work. Once you, you know, get your airframe and you're in, you know, flying for the Air Force, it's a, it's, it's a lot of work then as well. Right. And it's it's a lot of sacrifice for you and for your family in terms of how much time you're at home and how much time you're training and deployed. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing that and you're not passionate about it, I think that would be kind of painful. So you really need to, you know, whatever it is, make sure that you enjoy it to an extent, right? Not everybody just loves to go to work all the time. We'd all, you know, have hobbies we like too, but you shouldn't hate your job either. Yeah, no, totally agree. All right. So the Air Force decided to send you to Intel school. Why don't you give a few minutes to kind of talk through at least what it was when we went back a few years ago? It's always changing, right? You probably have a better idea than I do, seeing as you're 
one in Texas, two in Air Force Personnel Command. And so you kind of interact with the schoolhouse more than I do. Why don't you give the audience a little bit about what they can expect from Intel Officer Training School? Yeah, so kind of like you said, the details of the course will change over years. But I think some common themes are you're going to go PCS to San Angelo, Texas, to Goodfellow Air Force Base. You know, you'll be there for, I don't know, a six to seven month course, six to eight months. I'm not sure exactly how long it is right now. But Uh you'll be there. You'll go through it with a class of your peers that are also becoming intelligence officers. You become really close to that class, right? Because you're sitting around each other studying after hours sometimes, like all day for like six or seven months straight. And you get to know you get to know your classmates really well and you form good relationships with them, Mm -hmm. you know, as long as you're not an idiot as long as you can be a nice person, right? <laughs> Otherwise, I guess yeah. you'll form bad relationships, but yeah. as long as you're just a nice person and want to make friends, you get form lasting relationships, right? Which is why we're still friends and we talk all the time. And, and you know, we have our other classmates that we regularly talk to. Yeah. But you'll go there, go through that class. You'll learn all the basics of what it means to be an intelligence officer on how to go out into the Air Force after that. But to the myriad of things you can do as an intelligence officer and all the different fields and different kind of categories of work you can do in the Air Force as an intel officer, you'll leave that course equipped to be able to do that um, and to go and provide, you know, timely intelligence to whoever your kind of teammates or customers are at that time when you graduate. So it's a really good course. You know, it's rigorous. It's a fun time as long as you have a good attitude, just kind of like anything that's difficult, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a couple of things I'd like to point out you know, we can talk about them. For a lot of the people who go through the class, this may be their very first exposure to classified information and classified environments. And so it can be an adjustment, right? So the class is actually held in a secured compartment information facility or a SCIF. And if you've never worked in that environment, it can be a big shift. So you can't bring your cell phone in. There's probably one phone that you have access to if you're going to, you know, call home or have your folks, your, you know, family reach you or something, you're going to be exposed to and use classified information regularly. And that can all be kind of a big change. And I think that's a big part of the schoolhouse as well, right? To kind of train us on how to be in those environments. Oh yeah, hundred percent. It's kind of funny you mentioned that because I didn't even think about that, right? Because after doing it for 10 years, you just kind of get used to it. It's something that you get used to, right? Oh, when I go to work, I leave my phone in my car. When I come out of work, I have my phone again. It's just something that you become accustomed to. Yeah. And yeah, at the schoolhouse, you know, you don't have like a personal computer you're at all day, like at work, right? You also have the internet all day. So if your family needs to get a hold of you, they can shoot you an email or they can call, you know, one of your work lines. But yeah, at the schoolhouse, everyone doesn't have their own, you know, landline, phone or computer. So, but I mean, you're studying, you're busy all day anyway. Your family knows they'll see you after work. Yeah. But it is an adjustment learning to, you know, the government has their information that they need to keep secure and keep, you know, the wrong people from knowing and you become a part of that trusted network and you need to learn how to operate within it, the information's safe. Yeah. Well, and two, one of the things you mentioned is, you know, sometimes you're going to have late night studying. You can't bring your study material home because what you're studying is classified. So it's got to stay at work. And so that can be something that, you know, if you're heading to Intel school, just something to keep in mind that there's no such thing as, oh, I'll just bring these papers home and I'll study for a little bit before I go to bed. Like that's not a thing. Yeah. And we've talked about this too, Reed, like that's good and bad, right? Because it doesn't stop there. You can't take your classified work home once you graduate and work on it in the evenings. But that's, some people look at it as a bad thing. I have always looked at that as a good thing, right? Like when I go home after work, I'm not working. I'm spending time with my wife and my children, you know, and if you're single, you're spending your time doing your hobbies, talking to your friends and family, doing whatever you want, but you're not working because you know, you can't do most of your work. If you have some kind of admin, unclassified stuff, sure, you can work on that from home. But, you know, why would you do that? Just wait until you're at work. Yeah. Yeah. You and I have talked about that a lot. We like, it's almost like forced balance. You know, people talk about work-life balance. Being an intelligence officer, I feel kind of forces me into that balance because I can't do a lot of my work at home. I like that. But like you said, you know, pros and cons. Anything else that, you know, you think our audience should know about San Angelo or Intel training. Before we wrap up, we'll talk about how they get their assignments out of there. But other than that, is there anything else you can think of about Intel school in particular? No, I mean, there's some good restaurants there. That's for sure. Like I went back there on a, just a quick trip a month or two ago and there's a sandwich shops like 
I mean, you know, being in the military, we travel a lot. We get opportunity to go a lot of different countries and states. And it's probably like the best sandwich I've ever had in the world is I've had it in San Angelo, Texas. So yeah. And what the peasant village or Jason, I don't remember what it's called. Jason's Jason's deli during lunch and then peasant yeah. at night. Yeah. Great yeah, place. Go get those sandwiches at lunch. It's seriously, it's like probably the best sandwich I've ever had. Yeah. Anyway, that's something to look forward to or to know about if you're going to go to San Angelo, Texas. Yeah. And it's the hub of intelligence training for all of the Air Force. So all of the enlisted career fields that are Intel operators also go there. Because it's not a joint base like Hickam Air Force Base in Pearl Harbor. But you'll see other services training there as well. Exactly. As part of that Air Force training system. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So San Angelo is what you make it, right? It can be a miserable middle of nowhere town or it can be a wonderful hometown feel. It's kind of up to you to make it what it's going to be. And just another quick point on that, you know, being work again, working at Air Force Personnel Center, I've learned that that it is what you make it is true of every single base the Air Force will send you. I've sent people to Hawaii that have complained. I've sent people to DC <laughs> that have complained. You yeah. know, Hawaii, there's too much traffic. It's too expensive. Germany is too far from home. DC, there's too much traffic and it's too expensive. People go to Minot or Del Rio or San Angelo and they love it because it has that small hometown feel and they really get close to all the people they're stationed with. Like people love and hate every single place they go in the Air Force. And I've loved everywhere I've went. And I think that it's 100% up to your attitude. And every place you go will have a lot of good things about it. And if you seek those out and try to do those good, fun things, man, you'll love everywhere you're stationed. Yeah, totally agree. So let's kind of use that as a transition point to talk about how people get assignments out of Intel school. And then let's also talk about what are the options as Intel officers? Where can we go and kind of who can we work for? So let's start with yeah. how do we get assignments out of Intel school? Yeah, so how that works is, you know, all the different Air Force major commands and organizations will submit kind of, hey, we want these graduating lieutenants for our organization. The 14M assignment team will look at all of those and based on manning across, you know, the 14M community, we'll say, okay, for this graduating class, we're going to put lieutenants in this smattering of locations, right? Kind of balance across the force. Mm -hmm. So the schoolhouse will get that list. Let's just say it's 20 jobs, 20 people graduating. And then the schoolhouse at Goodfellow, the training cadre will look at that. They'll look at all the student preferences. They'll look at how the students are performed, where their strengths and weaknesses lie. And they will do that initial match, right? It's like, I think the only matching, you know, 01s through 05s that the assignments team doesn't do. Okay. And it's just right when you leave Goodfellow. So really, it depends. If you're going through Goodfellow as a, you know, just being trained, you're going to go through, you're going to perform well. Let's say I'm ranked, you know, fourth or fifth out of that class of 20. I'll probably get around my, you know, those people ahead of me will probably get higher preference than me just because they performed better during training. Uh-huh. Again, it's run by the cadre, right? So this can kind of shift and change. But I think essentially some things hold true. If you perform well, you have a higher chance of going where you want. Try to go somewhere where you're interested, mm -hmm. do a job that you're interested in, and somewhere where you can capitalize on your strengths as an officer, as an intel officer, as a person. And I think that's kind of how that goes. Yeah. No, that's really good. So before we go over, you know, your career path and what you've done, where are some places that... Intel officers can go. And we should caveat this. One of the reasons, besides the fact that you're one of my best friends, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is your current assignment is as an assignments officer. So you literally are moving the chess pieces across the board all over the planet to put Intel officers where they go. So you have a lot of unique insight. So what are some jobs and places where Intel officers can serve and work? I'll start off with kind of like the disciplines, right? The things you can do as an Intel officer. And I think that'll kind of drive, we'll talk about the locations. Okay. So as an Intel officer, one of the coolest things about our career field that is different than I think almost every other career field is the variety of missions that you can work. And I'll explain that, right? So my mom she knows me, right? Really well. She knows a thing about my personality. When I was growing up, she's like, Zane, you should try to find a job where you don't get bored. Because if you get bored, you're just not going to do as well than, you know, if you're kind of challenged and excited about what you're doing. 
And as an intel officer, you can go to a base for three or four years and at that base do like one to two different jobs, like doing different things. So as an intel officer, you can work with, I'm just going to kind of list them off here. You can work with special forces units. You can work with flying units, whether that's rescue units or fighter units or like, you know, heavy like transport plane units, reconnaissance aircraft units. You can work with signals intelligence. So all the stuff that has to do with, you know, the electronic spectrum and signals and the intel you can gather from that. You can work with cyber units. You can work with human intelligence units, you know, like debriefing people and and all that, you know, people kind of say like that spy stuff, but I mean, you know, like human intelligence and the intel you can gather from humans, you can work with national agencies. So there's a number of national agencies that you can work with, the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, um, the National Reconnaissance Office. Like there are just national strategic level jobs you can do with those agencies. You can work in an air operations center, right? So, and Reed can talk more about this because he's worked in one and I haven't, but I mean, I peripherally worked with them, but he, you know, this is how we run air operations in a certain area of the world. There's an AOC there. You can mm -hmm. work there as an intelligence officer. You can work on a number of staffs once you get to, you know, be a little bit more senior CGO or an FGO, a major lieutenant colonel, there are a ton of staffs you can work on. As an intel officer, you can also go, you know, work in recruiting. You can work as an ROTC instructor. Let's see what else. I know I'm missing some read because there's a lot. You can go work in kind of the distributed common ground system, the DCGS community, which is, you know, doing all the stuff when we get intelligence from aircraft and how do we process that intel and analyze it and get it to customers. Mm -hmm. What else, Reed? There's a lot of stuff you can do as an intelligence officer. Yeah. Well, before I go on, I'll see if I missed anything no, that you're thinking of. I think you're doing a great job of lining them out. I think you're covering it really well. I think it's important for our audience to understand that Almost nothing happens in the United States Department of Defense without that thing being informed by intelligence. Yeah. And so whether that's happening at the Pentagon or the White House or in a small unit in a FOB in Afghanistan, those actions are being driven by intelligence. And someone's got to collect it, someone's got to produce it, and someone's got to share it. And we're all Nobody's doing that. a mission. Yeah. Nobody's doing a mission in the Department of Defense or in the Air Force without having intelligence to support that mission Yeah, and to drive it. So nobody's doing that. Yeah. And so that's the thing I think you and I have talked about this a lot. I love our job because of the variety and the different things you can do. And yeah, anywhere there's a mission happening, there is some intelligence being either embedded directly or touching it in some way. And there's an intel officer somewhere leading and making that all happen. Yep, 100%. So, you know, let's say you're a person like me, right? And you don't like to do the same thing over and over. You like to do different things. So you can go and start your Air Force career and work with a special forces unit. And then you can be like, that was awesome. I want to go do something else. And then you can go work with a flying unit. And you're like, that was cool. I want to go do something else. You can go work with a cyber unit. Mm -hmm. and then you can go work on, you know, with a, a national agency like Defense Intelligence Agency or National Security Agency, you know, and all while you're doing that and working those different missions as an intel officer, you're getting a lot of leadership opportunities. Mm -hmm. Not all career fields do that, right? You're going to have the opportunity to lead anywhere from, you know, five to 40 people as you're doing those different jobs. So you get to see really cool missions, you get to participate in those and help advance those missions while you're continuing to lead to help your airmen develop and to help develop yourself as a leader. And help, you, you know, you're going through these organizations, working these missions, and you're trying to help as many people in those organizations as you can become better leaders and advance within their own career goals and their own personal goals. And you're help, you know, kind of, a, you know, rising tide, you know, helps all ships or however that saying goes. You're just going everywhere, doing great work, trying to make everyone better. And it's a fulfilling career. Yeah. And it's, it's fun to see the variety of it, all the different things you can do. Yeah, no, Absolutely. So with that, let's talk about places because Zane, being at the assignments officer, you know more than anybody how important where you live is to folks. So where can you live? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'll start off kind of like some of the major places, right? Some of the places in our career field and the Intel career field that as an officer, you have higher probabilities of serving, right? Okay. So some of the big hubs. Hawaii is a big hub. There are a lot of Intel jobs you can do in Hawaii, San Antonio, Texas, Virginia, Fort Meade, so Maryland, 
um, Germany, Ramstein yep. Airbase, Hosan Airbase in Korea is a big mm-hmm. hub. Mm-hmm. And then Washington, D.C., right? The national capital region. Those, yeah. I would say, are your... And then Florida. Not a specific base in Florida, but we have a lot of positions in Florida. Yeah. So those are like the bigger places. And then apart from that, some of the other places, I mean, you can go to Italy, you can go to Japan, you can go to Alaska. You got Beal up in California. We have a lot in Colorado as well. Yeah, so Colorado and then... You've got... um the Midwest, a lot of people at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. You've got a lot of people in Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. Mm-hmm. Got people in Louisiana. We have, you know, a smaller footprint up in like Boston. Yeah. Those are kind of the major places where we send people. Are there yeah. other places? Of course there are. Yeah. Uh, oh, United Kingdom. We have a you know decent amount of people in the UK as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But those I think I hit most of the big places. And like I said, there are a lot of other smaller opportunities Mm -hmm. of locations you can work as well. If you hated every single one of those locations that I just said, don't be an intel officer. But that's pretty much saying you hate (laughs) to live. A lot of continental United States, a lot of international places as well. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, like we said, no mission is happening without intelligence informing it. We are almost at every single location where there are Air Force members. Just depends on the likelihood of getting there, right? I mean, I had a buddy, intel officer assigned to Naval Air Station Key West, right? Oh, like, yeah, we have people at Key West. Yeah, yep. we, got, we got people everywhere. And so that's another thing I really love about this opportunity is the number and variety of places and things you can do. And yeah, I mean, I did. I neglected to mention some places, but just like Reed said, like we're doing assignments right now for people leaving, people moving in the summer of 2021, and I am assigning people to Key West. Yep. Like that's a thing, right? Like almost every operational Air Force base, you have intel officers there. Yep. So if you want to, you know, stay within about a five state zone and never go anywhere cool, that can probably happen. If you want to, you know, go international. It'll be hard to do in the military. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But still being in intel. In the CONUS. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like say you went from Fort Meade to DC to Virginia and then back up to Fort Meade. Like that would be a little unusual, but still possible. It's not like other career fields where, you know, every single move, I don't know, you've got the whole range, right? You and I know Intel officers who have never left, Yeah. you know, their thing and they stay kind of close. And then others, they've been assigned overseas multiple times. Just we've got the whole range, if you will. Yeah. Yep. And that's another good thing kind of about the career field is you can find what you like and, you know, really try to do that as much as you can. Yeah. So... After Intel school, let's talk a little bit about your career path and kind of the things you've done as an example of the variety. Just give, you know, your career history. So you left Intel school, you finished pretty well in the class, and your first assignment was up at the National Security Agency at Fort Meade, right? Yeah, so my first assignment, I went up to Fort Meade. It was kind of funny, like I was, I think, just a few months left of my training. We'd already found out what jobs we had, and I got a phone call. They pulled me out of class. I had a phone call from my commander of the unit that I was going to at Fort Meade. And he said, hey, Zane, when you get here, the month you get here, would you like to start training to deploy for six months? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, sure. Like, you know, I was like, yeah, let's do it. So I went to Fort Meade. The first thing I did was get ready for a deployment. And then I deployed for six months to Afghanistan with, it was kind of a non-standard deployment, but at the time it was more common. I deployed with Army Special Forces Mm-hmm. in Afghanistan for six months. So right off the bat, I worked with special forces. Really great experience. After that, I went back to Fort Meade and I worked signals intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. For a couple of years. Then while I was on there, I did a like, you know, a quick year of staff time. After being at Fort Meade, which I would classify as getting, you know, a little bit of staff experience, some signals intelligence experience, and some army, you know, special forces deployment experience. I went to Korea. It was a staff position there where I worked really closely with the DCGS, the Distributed Common Ground System. So the, you know, when we get intel from kind of reconnaissance platforms and how do we use that intel, right, in a way that we need just as, a, as an Air Force. Yep. So I worked closely with them and I worked closely with the Air Operations Center. So, you know, mm-hmm. like we said, that center doing all the air operations in that region. So worked closely with them. Only did that for a year. It was a quick year. It was awesome living in Korea. You know, my wife and I had a small kid at the time. We went 
Well, our kid was small at the time. We still have a kid. <laughs> we took a trip to Japan. We took a trip to China. A lot of people stationed in Korea go visit Vietnam and uh-huh. Cambodia, all kinds of places. But it was a fun year to travel. It was a fun year to work really hard and learn the mission and work with the Koreans. The South Koreans are awesome people and awesome mm-hmm. culture, really fun, going up to Seoul every month. So that was a really fun assignment. And then after that, I went to San Antonio and I worked in a cyber unit. Mm -hmm. And then I transferred over to the base I'm at now at Randolph, and I'm the Intel Officer Assignments Team at Air Force Personnel Command. So in a nutshell, what have I done in my career? Did some time with Army Special Forces, Signals Intelligence, some staff stuff in Korea where I worked with the AOC and the DGS a little bit, and then a cyber unit. So not a ton of things. I'd say kind of three things, right? Soft, SIGINT, and cyber so far. Yeah. And then... After my next assignment, I'll be going to a space unit. So I'll be an Air Force officer in a United States Space Force unit in a leadership role there. And I have some space experience. I guess I neglected to mention this. When I was at Fort Meade, some of the signals intelligence work there I did was very, very space-centric. So I got some good space intelligence experience there as well, which is you know, a good reason why I'm going to the Space Force unit to be in a role there. So I'm excited for that as well. So that's how my career has gone so far. I mean, right there, that's the first half of my career. We'll see how the next, you know, 10 to 20 years, however long I stay in the Air Force, how that goes. I've loved it so far, and I'm excited to see how it goes in the future. Yeah. And again, it just highlights the breadth and depth of different options that you get in this field, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. So real fast, something you and I have talked about a couple times, and our audience may not be super familiar with. Let's talk about the fact that when you're an Air Force intelligence officer, you're also a part of the intelligence community. Let's talk a little bit about that dynamic because it's almost like you're not just joining the Air Force. You're also joining this entire other government organization, if you will, of the interagency where you've kind of mentioned it, right? You work for national agencies. Well, those people have career intelligence officers as well. CIA, DIA, NGA, NRO, you know, all these other big organizations. So talk a little bit about how that plays in, because you're almost trying to develop yourself in multiple ways. You're trying to develop as a leader, as an Air Force officer, but also as an intelligence professional. No, yeah, that's great. I think I saw a thing in the news the other day about how the United States Space Force was like officially, you know, recognized as like the 18th member of the intelligence community or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I did. Yeah. So it's cool. Just like Reed said, you're going to be an Air Force Intel officer. And at the same time, you're kind of going into this larger community of a bunch of civilians, a bunch of Navy folks, a bunch of Army folks, a bunch of Marines, a bunch of Space Force folks now that are all, you know, they all have their Intel folks too. So you're joining that community. So it's like you're joining the Air Force, you're an airman, but you're also kind of like secondarily part of this Intel community. And whenever you decide to leave the Air Force, which everyone leaves the Air Force, right? Yeah. At some point, some people leave after four years, some people leave after like 40 years. (laughs) Yeah. But when you leave, if you loved Intel and you love that, you can just keep working until like the day you die Yeah. somewhere within the intelligence community. And for however long you're in the Air Force, you know, you're going to figure out what you like as a person, Mm -hmm. what you like to do, where your strengths lie. And you can try to, you know, you can continue to work, you know, you'll have your clearance, you'll have experience, you can continue to try to work within the intelligence community. And there's so many cool things you can do. Yeah, so many cool things you can do. So it's kind of cool, because you're not just doing an Air Force job and then doing something else like you can continue that experience, if you want, and keep working in whatever, you know, part of the intelligence community that you like, for much longer, many more years, if you want. Yeah. And I think you nailed it, right? There are now 18 other departments and agencies that form the core of the intelligence community. And there are a lot of people doing that. And you now become part of that community as well. And I've had really positive exchanges with my fellow intelligence officers in other agencies, NGA in particular. I remember on my deployment out to the UK, you know, we had DIA people there. We had NGA people there. And I was not just an airman to them. I was a fellow intelligence member of the intelligence community. So it's a different thing that I think people don't necessarily think about when they think about this career field. It's a much bigger thing than just the Air Force. No, that's, yeah, that's a great point to highlight. Well put. Yeah. 
how do you interact with your family and friends and loved ones when talk about work or that at all, when you can't really talk about work? Let's, let's explore that a little bit, kind of equip our audience, you know, cause there's some young, you know, maybe college juniors or seniors that, you know, dropped Intel, they're super excited, but let's kind of give them some things to think about as they interact with their fellow families and friends, you know, they can't talk about work, but can they, you know, let's talk about that. What are your thoughts? No, I think there's a spectrum, right? I fall on one end of the spectrum. I'm sure some people fall on the complete other side of the spectrum. It's never bothered me not being able to talk specifics about my job with my family. Mm -hmm. And some people, I'm sure it bothers, especially if they, you know, deal with something or some kind of scenario or some kind of situation that was difficult for them to process. That's never quite been me. Mm -hmm. But like, if there's a bunch of classified information, you know, it doesn't mean you can't talk to your family about like how you feel and what's difficult for you, right? Yeah. Like I'll make up the situation, right? Like, let's say I went to work and I watched, you know, I'm just going to totally just make something up. Like I watched some guy make a hamburger and I watched him put the ketchup on and the mayo and the mustard and the lettuce and the cheese and the meat. And for some reason that like scarred me. Yeah. And let's say all of that information was classified that they put lettuce on the burger and cheese and meat, all the different condiments. Mm -hmm. That was classified. So I can't go home to my wife and say, man, Nicole, it was really hard for me to watch this. You know, I can't tell her all those details. But what I could tell her is like, hey, Nicole, I went to work and I had a hard day. Like I watched something that was difficult for me to process. And this is why, right? It was just difficult because I didn't relate to it. And I didn't understand why they did the things they did. And I can talk about that. That's not classified. Yeah, I'm not telling her about the lettuce and the cheese and the meat. So yeah. like you can talk about things that are challenging to you, mm -hmm. but I, I've also, you know, it's just something to think about. Like you can still talk about things that are challenging to you at work. And a lot of the things that are going to be challenging, to be honest, are probably going to be leadership related. Yeah. And you can talk about that to your family and your mom and your dad and your support system and your brother mm -hmm. all day long. Right. Yeah. But yeah, just like Reed said, like some of the stuff, you, know, you might see something and you can't share all the details that maybe you do want to. But, you know, you can share that with your coworkers at work yeah. and your leadership. And you kind of have a different support system, right, in the Air Force. You have your unit and your team. Mm -hmm. But all good things to think about. It's funny because you actually use one of the tools I use. I make up an analogy that people can understand as a way to describe why it was hard. So I loved what you did because that's exactly the tool I use, right? Interesting. I think about my audience, you know, and it's, in particular, usually my wife, and I think about her life experience, the things she knows and the things she would understand. And I say, oh, you know, exactly like you described, I watched a guy make a hamburger today and she doesn't need to know all the details, but I love that how you use that analogy because I use that all the time as a way to not talk around it, right? To not hide or be mysterious or weird, but as a way to describe why something was hard without uncovering things I'm not supposed to share. I thought that was really good. The other thing though, too, is a lot of what people have issues with, and you really hit on it, it's interpersonal stuff. I'm not getting along with this person, or I didn't do very well with something. And those things you can totally talk about, right? Those aren't classified details of what your boss said to you or whatever. So I think people put up too many barriers, you know, in quotes, talking about work. But there are some barriers that you won't be able to take them to your desk. You know, like that's kind of a real thing. They may not be able to come visit you at work. So those are just things to keep in mind. I love how you use an analogy just like I do, even when we were just trying to describe it. That was really funny. Awesome. Yeah. Let's cover career progression. I know there is no such thing as a typical career, right? Your career is very different from mine. I left Intel school, went to the AOC. I deployed to al Udeed while I was there doing very Air Force mission. And then I went to Maxwell Air Force Base to do an instructor job. And now I'm at the National Security Agency. And now I'm going to follow that on with a job in Ohio. So there's not really a typical career, but what is like the career progression look like for a quote, typical career? I'd say for the first six to eight years of an Intel officer's career, your whole job is to just go and do different things and to get good at them and develop yourself as a leader. So whether that's Reed going to the AOC and going to be an instructor and going to work signals intelligence, whether that's Zane going to work signals intelligence in space and cyber, 
it doesn't matter what you do. What matters is that you do it, that you get good at it, and that you develop yourself as a leader and that you get experience in, you know, in a good range of missions. Because after that first six to eight years, what the Air Force wants is they want field grade officers. They want majors and lieutenant colonels who can go into leadership and staff positions and capitalize on all the experience they got during the first six to eight years of being experts, you know, getting really good at what they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty much it. It's kind of a simple career. Yeah. For six, eight years, go and do a bunch of things and, you know, in Air Force Intel and in the Intel community and become a good leader. Yeah. After that, when you're an FGO, continue to be a good leader in leadership roles and go to staff positions and lead on those staffs and use what you've learned to advance those missions as a field grade officer. I mean, that's pretty much it. It's kind of simple. Yeah. I want to add more, but I mean, that's it. Yeah. So I came in as an acquisitions officer, which doesn't have as clear of a career progression, at least it didn't at the time, especially for chemists. So to come into a career where there was a clear plan, you know, be a technical expert for that six to eight years, and then make sure you're preparing yourself to be a leader at higher levels of responsibility was really refreshing for me. It was really nice. And I like that there is a path that you can kind of chart if I'm going to stay this is kind of what it's going to look like. So I think that's good. Awesome. All right, Zane, this has been helpful and I appreciate you taking the time and I hope our audience has gotten something out of this, you know, as they think about the intelligence career field. You know, our primary job is to communicate information and help decision makers be informed. So in that though, we also have to lead people. That's a big part of what we do as Intel officers. So what is your leadership philosophy? You know, if we would boil down Zane's essence of leadership, what does that look like? You know, you hear this kind of, I don't like how much you hear the word and how much, you know, kind of as a buzzword, but the older I've gotten and the more like great leaders I've seen in the Air Force, the more I realize it's true. Like you as a leader, you need to understand what you're doing so that you can have a vision for your team. If you don't have a vision of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish, you can't lead them to that. So, you know, you have to have a strong vision as a leader of what your team is trying to accomplish. I'd say that's the first step. The second step is you've got to take care of your people. Like, you know, if I'm leading Reed, like, and Reed's on my team, I've got to say, Reed, here's what we're doing. If you run into obstacles in your personal life, in your professional life, obstacles, you know, as you're trying to do these work tasks, you know, you're working with other offices that are difficult or this or that, like, tell me these obstacles, and I will give you the tools and the advice or help you remove those obstacles. Mm -hmm. So have a vision, care about your people, and like help them remove obstacles to accomplish that vision. And I mean, I'd say the third step, you've just got to like be a good person. Like when you're growing up and you're in high school and, you know, in college and you have friends and you have siblings, like if everyone's looking at you and being like, dude, you're an idiot, like you're rude, like you shouldn't be like that as a leader, right? Yeah. Like just at that common sense relationships with people level, always just work on being, you know, a person that people, you know, they respect you and they're comfortable being around you because there's respect there and you're just a good person. So to kind of recap that, have a vision, care about your people and remove obstacles that are preventing them from advancing as leaders and advancing the mission that you're working on. And then just be a good person, right? Yeah. I mean, the Air Force core values, right? Like have integrity, like help people, serve people, and just try to do really well at what you're doing. Yeah. I'd kind of sum it up that way. No, that's awesome. And I think one of the reasons you and I get along is we're very much on the same page on those things. You know, we've had leaders that we've worked for that didn't fulfill some of those things and it was pretty lousy, right? Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah, and it can be really challenging. Well, Zane, really appreciate you taking the time. If anybody in our audience wants to get in touch with you or ask you any questions, best way for them to get in touch with you is to reach out to the podcast and we'll put them in touch and they can fire any questions your way. You're moving on from your assignments officer responsibility. So no, you can't help them get this amazing job. <laughs> Don't ask anyway, right? That that wouldn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we're really, really fair on the team. Yeah. You know, we don't do anybody these special favors. We really, 
do our job in the most fair and equitable way that we can Mm -hmm. to get the right people to the right jobs to kind of, you know, help them and help the Air Force mission. Yeah, I've really gained a lot of insight and value from your assignment is talking through how this all works. I've gained a much deeper confidence that the system is working and is trying to be as fair and even as possible. And that's been really valuable. Anything else you want to say before you wrap up? No, thanks for the opportunity to kind of, you know, talk through this and answer these questions. It's been fun. I'm always down to chat with you, Reed, but it's been kind of fun to do this in a more kind of structured and a little bit, you know, formal, informal way, more formal than us just chatting after work. But yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a fun experience. Awesome. Thanks, man. Reed, that was so fun to listen to. Just like listening to two bros just going back and forth, talking about something that you care deeply about. It was fun to feel the energy and the excitement around what you get to do as intel officers for the Air Force. So thanks for bringing Zane into the conversation. So fun to listen to. I appreciate it. You know, and it's funny, though, even though, Colin, Zane and I could have talked for hours. <laughs> we do this all the time. He is one of those guys that we will get on the phone and we will just talk endlessly about some, you know, nitnoid policy about how, you know, officers are developing, about the career field, whatever. We do this all the time. But because Colin, he and I talk about this all the time, we missed some things yeah. <laughs> that, that are just kind of like basic things that intelligence officers do and how they develop. So I want to cover some of those now so that our audience has a more complete understanding about, first off, what is it that we do? We talked about some of the cool things we get to do and places we get to go and missions we get to be involved in, but we didn't put that in context. And the context is actually pretty straightforward. Our job as intelligence officers is to communicate information about three things, our adversary capability, our adversary activities, and our adversary intent. Those three things make up all intelligence activities. Yeah. So. Think about it from, let me put it in some different words. If I know what You're going to talk about a hamburger again? No, that was so good. That, I just love that, by the way, <laughs> that I do that all the time in order to describe situation. It is so good. So if I'm thinking about an adversary that we might have to engage with, I need to know what they're capable of. I need to know what it is they can do. They can make vanilla ice cream. Okay, come on. <laughs> We can even think about aircraft. Do they have aircraft that are capable of being stealth? That's a great question, right? Yeah. So that, that's one example. And then another thing is activities. What are our adversaries doing? Where are they? And what are they doing? We need to know that information. And it's something our adversaries don't want us to know. Yeah. They don't want us to know where all the toys are and what they're doing with them. The next thing is what their intent is. What is it that they want to do? If we know what they want to do, what they are capable of doing, and maybe a little bit about what they are doing, that gives us a decision advantage. That allows us to go through the OODA loop faster and to be in a decision space to give us a tactical strategic advantage. That's the whole purpose of intelligence. Yeah. I really like what you're talking about. Thank you for explaining that. It helps put the intel officer and the intel community into the context of what we're trying to do in the Air Force. And one thing that is jumping out to me about how you're describing it is that it's all about the adversary. And you didn't get into it in the interview and you're not stating it straightforward here. But the fact is, is that you collect and you disseminate intel externally. Never will the intel community look inward to see what our people are doing. That's not part of your responsibility. Am I reading that correctly? A hundred percent. I mean, it's straight up illegal. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, spend, we spend a lot of time training, talking about, and understanding all of the laws that explain that precise thing. At Intel School, it's actually something we get really frustrated about. I don't know a whole lot about U.S. Air Force systems, about our capabilities, activities, and intent. I'm not really good at that. You want me to talk about an adversary, their Air Force? I know a whole lot about that. And that's yeah. very deliberate. We, I mean, we are beat about the neck and face figuratively in Intel school. You are focused on red systems and red being adversarial systems, right? Yeah. We do learn blue. That is important. And depending on the job you're fulfilling, you may have to 
get right into some of those things and that kind of thing. But overwhelmingly, we are looking externally to provide our people with decision advantage. Good catch on that. Thanks for helping me describe that. Yeah. And then another thing that I want to bring out of what you are describing here is the importance of information in the leadership and decision-making process. It's not just Intel officers that share information. You may be the only ones sharing Intel on the adversary because you're the ones that have it, you collect it, you disseminate it, right? But every single one of us has a responsibility to ask the questions of what do I know, who needs to know, and have I told them? You know, that comes straight from former Defense Secretary Mattis's book, Call Sign Chaos, right? And that is something that we should all be thinking about of how can we enable that OODA loop to go even faster and just borrow some of the principles from what you've described of what you do as an Intel officer? Yeah, I think that's a really good perspective because information is warfare. We are entering an age where information is warfare and intelligence is operations. And that's one of the things I love about this field is it's not going anywhere. It's becoming increasingly important. And just like you described, Colin, the skills that we acquire through our training and formal education are broadly applicable to just about everyone in whatever role they're fulfilling. Yeah, and it's because it's so broadly applicable. We see why, as you described in the interview, how big and broad the Intel mission is and how big and broad the community is and how it's not possible for you to cover every possible thing that Intel can be involved in because they're involved in everything. Yeah. And all the good and bad that comes with that, right? You could be stationed in Key West, Florida. That sounds amazing. Or Thule, Greenland. That sounds terrible. <laughs> and just Well, it's, it's so, that's the thing. There are people who, and Zane described this, right? He said, there are people who get miserable when I send them to Hawaii. There are people who absolutely love me when I send them to Minot. Like, it's just such a broad field. You're going to be able to go just about anywhere. He did hit on, you know, kind of the major hubs. And Colin, we didn't even cover the half of it. You know, there's just so much. And that's one of the biggest appeals for me. And that's just in the Air Force. You described somewhere in the interview that that the Air Force is one of like 18 partners in the whole intelligence community. Exactly. I can't even wrap my mind around that. I mean, the Air Force is both big enough and small enough on its own. But to add this other element to it is just... One, it's really fascinating. Two, it, it's something that I totally just don't understand. And it's really great to then have these kinds of conversations, not only with Zane, but all of the other AFSCs that we've interviewed so that we can be a little bit more aware of what our counterparts in the Air Force are doing or involved in. Yeah, because it certainly was not something I was tracking, right? It was not something I had thought about. I thought I was joining the Air Force. And then when I was cross-trained, I thought I was going to be an Air Force intelligence officer. That is my core Air Force specialty code. But it's a lot bigger than that. Yeah. I joined this whole other thing. I just didn't even know really was out there. And being a part of the, quote, IC is pretty special and pretty rewarding. Uh, Colin, there's a couple other things I didn't mention when it comes to officer development. Again, this is just stuff that Zane and I just know. And so we didn't really cover it. but. We have some regular career progression and formal training that we experience, so I want to describe that. First, the most basic is the ISR series. So Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Training. The ISR 100 course is considered your basic training that you go through at Goodfellow that he described. Then when you're a captain, you're going to go through ISR 200. That's actually at Maxwell, tacked on either before or after SOS. And so it's a couple of weeks long, it's just intelligence officers and a refresher kind of get you spun up on some of the new things and make you a better ISR operator. And then when you're a major, you're eligible to go to ISR 300, which is back at Goodfellow Air Force Base. So that's kind of like the structured training that you're going to go through for most intel officers. There's also a series of special programs you can do. Zane mentioned weapons school. Not uncommon for folks to go through weapons school. Those are definitely some of our sharpest folks that go through that program. We have a couple other special programs. So there's the Junior Officer Cryptologic Career Program, which is an internship at the National Security Agency to become basically a career cryptology expert. Then you've got 
the JOGP, which is Junior Officer Geospatial Intelligence, which is at NGA. And that's, you know, to kind of make you an expert in geospatial intelligence. Uh, and then the last series of trainings are called Intel Formal Training Units or IFTUs. So if you get a job, let's say you're at the schoolhouse and you, you get selected to go to San Antonio to do some cyber job. They're going to send you to an Intel formal training unit to get your initial qualification training. And let's say you accomplish that training, you go to your unit, you have a great experience, and then they want to send you to be a targeting unit. There's another targeting if two. Then let's say they send you to go be at a flying unit. Well, there's a, a unit support if two. And so there's a whole lot of training that we get to be exposed to. And that's one of the other things I love about this is the variety. So I started out my career at the AOC, went to the AOC if two, and that will keep happening as I go to units where I don't have experience, I get to have a variety of experiences in training and getting qualified so that I can help communicate capability, activity, and intent. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Reed. It sounds like if you're going to be an Intel officer, you're going to be TDY a lot to go to all of these different training programs professional development, that sort of thing. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair thing to say. And that kind of leads me to the last thing. We deploy. Intelligence officers deploy. And that is absolutely an expectation. It's also pretty well expected that you'll do a remote tour at some point. And so you need to know that going in. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of exercises and we didn't even talk about that. Good grief. I just, you know, right? There's red flags. There's all sorts of these exercises that you should participate in because that is the family business. And to have that broad picture of what it is Air Force Intelligence is doing, you need to really have as many experiences as possible. So yeah, I think it's a good thing to keep in mind that there's going to be some travel associated with being in this career field. Yeah. And that all talks about like the things that you're doing as you're developing as a Intel officer and then didn't really get into the interview. Haven't really said it yet, but there's opportunities for you to command at every level of the Air Force as well, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. There's, oh gosh, I don't even know how many Intel squadrons and groups and wings and, and yeah, there's absolutely many leadership opportunities. You're not always going to be just embedded into an operations squadron or an operations support squadron. There will also be opportunities for you to be in a deliberate Intel squadron or an Intel group, or there are Intel wings, right? There are. There are a number of them. Absolutely. And then there's a numbered Air Force, 16th? 16th Air Force, yeah. The 16th Air Force that has a two-star, and then there's a three-star A26 for the Air Force. And so, yeah, not only can you do everything— across the Air Force, but you can lead at every level. So it sounds like it's a huge career field, lots of opportunity for growth and development, both within the Air Force. And then there's that intelligence community that you can continue to be a part of once you take the uniform off and you want to go do something else. Yeah, precisely. And we haven't even covered the fact that intelligence officers can command cyber units and cyber officers can command intelligence units. Wow. So okay. we, we haven't even gotten, I mean, yeah, so it just keeps going. There's a lot of options. Again, there's no way we can cover it all. So for those in the audience who are interested or have questions, Zane and I are both ready, happy, and willing to engage with you and answer your questions. So yeah, a lot of fun talking to Zane about this stuff. And Colin, what have I missed? <laughs> You've missed nothing and everything at the same time, just like yeah. Intel is everything all at the same time. So exactly. The point here is the invitation to the audience to reach out to you and you can put them in touch with Zane. And if the two of you can't answer the question, you can find somebody who can so long as it's not classified, right? Yeah, we'll do our best to, to answer your questions. And if we have to break out the hamburger analogy, we'll do it. <laughs> it was perfect. It was so good. That's awesome. I think that's a good place to leave it there, Reed. Thanks so much for bringing Zane in. Again, it was super fun to hear the banter back and forth, the conversation between two friends about something that you both care so deeply about. Yeah, appreciate it. That will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.